Hello and welcome back to Internalize the podcast where there is nothing consistent and only random stuff that happens. Uh the intro has also changed. I don't know what I am speaking and yeah. Uh, today is going to be quite a short episode because um I procrastinated and I did not write my blog post until like half an hour ago. So I don't have anything much to uh well I don't really know what to say. I mean I didn't have the time to write a legitimate blog post. So yeah, I'm just going to riff off of my thoughts on stuff, nothing really specific, nothing really new, I suppose. But uh actually no, I mean there it is something specific, but it it's not going to be anything very uh what do you say? It's not going to be very detailed, so to speak. It's just sort of an interesting observation I had. So, uh, yeah, let us talk about uh, about Apple as we did two weeks ago. I suppose Apple, funny company, do funny things, make funny stuff. Uh, sort of innovative, sort of maybe not. I don't know, man. Apple is a funny company. But usually I think Apple makes pretty decent products most of the time. Uh but anyway, what am I saying? Yeah. Uh yeah, where well, that's where I was getting to. They make pretty decent products most of the time, but they have a couple of like smash hits which have never been like they still remain untouched. And one of those is of course the iPad. The iPad has been the de facto uh tablet for a long 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 time. And uh well, it doesn't look like it's on course to change anytime soon. The iPad has, well, existed forever. Uh, there have been competitors, but none of them have really kept up with the same, you know, technological innovation as well as developer interest as the iPad has done. And well, that has made it pretty dominant and the de facto pick across every price range, basically. Uh, so yeah. The iPad, they, uh, so the thing, interesting thing about iPads is, uh, they have been pretty in, insanely powerful for a long time. I like my iPad. It's, it's like a 2020, I believe iPad pro and it's nuts. It's superly powerful and it's like three years old at this point. After this, after that iPad, there has been an M1 model. So that had the A12Z chip after that was the M1 model. And then with the M, uh, M2 model, which recently launched, right? Uh, so anyway, there's never been any question per se about, uh, the, the performance of the iPad. Uh, actually, I think most people, most tech heads would agree with me. And in saying that the iPad is ridiculously overpowered for what it is, it's basically just a glorified, you know, smart TV with like an Xbox built in. I, it doesn't, you can't really do much beyond that. I guess technically you could develop apps on Swift playgrounds, but like no one is developing, uh, you know, a stupidly complex app on the iPad, right? You'd probably just use Xcode for that. But yeah, the thing is the iPad has had all this horsepower for so long and there's never been really much, uh, consensus or much question about what you can, or there's never been much answers about what there have been questions, questions galore about what you can do with the kind of power the, the iPad offers. And, uh, interesting, uh, interestingly, uh, people have been asking for a uh, final cut on the iPad for ages, uh, like literally ages. Uh, I remember people would use an app called Luma fusion because you know, iMovie was kind of mid still is kind of mid. And, uh, so was, uh, you know, premier rush, like it was fine for what it did, but it didn't do much. And that was the whole consensus or the whole, uh, image of the iPad. You could do stuff on it, but there's no really, there's no need for having, you know, an M1 chip. So there, there wasn't really much reason to get the, the pro model over the air or even the baseline. But anyway, uh, I'm getting past the point. Uh, the point is recently, I can't remember when I can actually just Google this. Uh, Google. 
Yeah, la- late last year, 2022, October-ish, DaVinci Resolve was announced for the iPad by Blackmagic Design. And it has been launched for a while. And I've actually used it and it's not a, pre- it's not a bad piece of software. It's actually pretty nice. Um, and that has that was probably the first uh, indication that uh, it's this is the time when people are actually going to start developing stuff that uses the um, the mag the horsepower that uh, the iPad provides, and uh, I think people were expecting uh, Apple to launch Final Cut and Logic for a long time on the iPad, and that hasn't happened until very recently. And uh, again, I can kind of figure out Apple Final Cut iPad. Uh, let's see. I don't remember. It's very recent. The videos are like a month old. Uh, it's yeah, it was out very recently and that uh, finally, finally, we have Final Cut on iPad as well as Logic Pro, which is basically is a digital audio workstation. It's kind of Final Cut's counterpart in the music world. It's ridiculously good. I'm I, I love Logic, but uh, yeah, Final Cut is out and let's talk about it. So first up is sort of imp- let's talk about Final Cut because it's a it's probably a bit more interesting of the two pieces of software because there's a lot more unknown with Final Cut. Uh, more on that later, we have some information on logic already and we have had it for a while and I'll, uh, I'll elaborate on that a little bit later and, uh, yeah, so final cut, uh, of course it, it's the, you know, it's the media baby, I suppose it's every, like so many YouTubers use it and, uh, therefore it's been covered by the media super, super in depth and like widely covered as well and yeah so something interesting that i've been something important that i've been thinking about is how apple would implement a touch first interface for final cut right people use keyboard cases i suppose with the ipad but it is an it's a tablet after all it's a touch first device and editing video editing has never really been well suited to touch and like if anyone has used imovie on iphone uh, beyond doing super simple stuff, it gets a little bit, uh, you know, complex and kind of annoying as well. But anyway, so that's that's uh, that's been a question on my mind. And seeing how a professional app where you get more, you know, complex projects uh, on the timeline, seeing how that uh, translates was quite an interesting question uh, that I wanted to see answered. So looks like Apple has answered it quite well. Uh, Like they've introduced something specifically for the iPad, like a jog wheel. That's kind of meant, it is a multi-function thing, but it's meant mainly to scrub through footage and to trim and like nudge clips and things. And it does solve the issues that may have arisen from directly porting a Mac app to iPad. It's made things a lot more, uh, I guess, touch friendly, if that's an overused word, but probably the only way I can think about describing. Again. It's an Apple app. It has its ecosystem perks, I suppose. It has iMovie import and movement from Mac to iPad. Like you can move projects from one uh, device to the other if you own both. And uh, yeah, uh, iMovie import is, I guess, sort of useful. Maybe not, can't say yet. Uh, Yeah, but there's the one very cool uh, iPad specific feature is called live drawing. Basically where you um, you can draw on your clips, on your final timeline or something. Not on the timeline, but the clip that you're editing. You can kind of draw on it with your Apple Pencil and it'll record it and place it as a, you know, it'll create an animated title, which is nuts. So you can do it so easily. And it has, you know, it's their own machine learning features. Like it has auto masking and auto crop, that kind of thing, which is pretty cool. And I guess it's sort of expected from Final Cut. Uh, but yeah, uh, one interesting question though is, uh, plugin support. Plugins are a huge part of the, uh, ecosystem and huge part of the story on iPad, uh, on Mac, sorry, on Final Cut for Mac and seeing whether A, it's even supported and B, whether developers will develop iPad versions of their plugins or whether the Mac versions are supported on Final, Final Cut for iPad. That remains unanswered for now. 
and we need to look more into it to see what actually happens. Next up, Logic. Logic again in the media has played second fiddle, second fiddle to Final Cut. Never really been in the focus of media ever. Sort of, you know, Logic's Logic is probably sort of Final Cut's baby brother in that sense. But it's no slouch on the Mac. It's super well known in the music world. The industry is basically an industry standard door, one of the industry standard doors, and it's known for being extremely great value for money. Something you rarely say about Apple products, but it's true in this case. It's supposed to be a super super value for money product compared to you know the other offerings on the market, and it has incredible stock plugins and virtual instruments. I think the main um, the main uh, what do you call what's the word for it the main um, the main pull for Logic is the fact that you don't really need third-party plugins to work it. Like it has its own version of pitch correction and stuff built in and it's pretty, it's really quite good. Now Logic is definitely more suited for the touch interface than Final Cut. And just because music production as a whole is, and is like this and Apple has known this because they had a whole iPad app meant for Logic control. Like it let you control Logic Pro on a, on your Mac. Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, it's an iPad app and you could like connect it to your Mac and just use the touch interface, which is cool. Anyway, so also it sort of removes the need for a MIDI keyboard to some extent, maybe, but can't say. Again, you have your Apple specific features like GarageBand project import, Mac cross compatibility and iPad specific features like, uh, you know, like super detailed automation with the Apple pencil and things. But, yeah, again, the library, music library seems quite extensive and uh, Logic's reputation for having a ton of plugins carries over. And unlike Final Cut, which is sort of up in the air at the moment, Logic actually does have support for third party plugins with the extension called AU Audio Unit. And uh, that has been there on GarageBand for a while as well. And seeing that come to Logic is also, it's not a surprise to be honest, but yeah. One thing I'm pretty interested about is the faders is like in uh, there's like touch mixing, which is super, 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 super cool. And I really want logic just for that. But yeah, who is this for? I think mainly it's for people who are traveling and on the go much of the time. It doesn't have the kind of features that uh, what do you call it? That uh, the Mac version does. I mean, all of them are a little bit cut back. But again, being an iPad really cuts down the friction that, uh, you know, that arises from come having an idea and sort of executing on it. But yeah, it's super powerful. I'm really excited. Unfortunately, it's a subscription. It's like $5 a month, which kind of sucks, but I'm excited. I, I want to see how this goes and I want to, I want to really try out logic specifically. I don't care much for Final Cut which is not something people say very often, but logic sounds super cool. Anyway, that's all for today. This was Breakneck, I suppose. Thank you for listening. Goodbye.